So when I reflected on the work that I'd created uh, this year at WAS, um, as well as um, my practice before this year, um, it came to light that um, a sense of home and belonging, uh, particularly in the natural landscape, was a recurring theme. Um, and then during one of the projects this year, uh, I realised that I'd lived in seven different houses in seven years. Um, so I started exploring that. And this year has also been a, a year of uh, lots of change and transition. So those things sort of combined and I started considering um, more about what the concept of home is. Um, and that it's not just the kind of physical structure, but also um, in the environment and people, um, places, memories and, and internal spaces as well. Um, and that's when one of the tutors introduced the concept of Heimat to me as well. The five quite delicate uh, structures relate to um, kind of my exploration of the concept of Heimat, um, which is a, a German word that encapsulates um, a sense of belonging and community, uh, nostalgia, um, and that each structure relates to a different um, space that I've lived uh, in the in the five years that I've been in Oxfordshire. The layered imagery on each structure um, is a mixture of photos and found images um, from that time that I'd taken at that time. Um, and you're also invited to uh, put on the headphones and sort of enter into those time and, and spaces um, to listen to a different soundtrack for each um, structure and possibly consider what your sense of high mark and where you get that from um, is. Here I am at work in the studio at Northampton University. I'm making a print, um, a photopolymer print for another project that I'm doing. But this was the place that first inspired me to do work about the radio. I don't know if you can hear, but the radio is on playing in the background. And it's playing, it plays constantly, all the time. I spoke to a lot of people about the radio and what they listen to and why and how and it became quite an obsession and the radioness became a total immersion. And what I discovered when I spoke to people was although they, they enjoyed the radio hugely and they found it challenging and interesting and um, informative and just sometimes really good company like me working in an empty studio or an empty house, there it is, this wonderful sound, whatever you like to listen to. Somehow the physical presence of the actual radio is important. So my intention was to give the radio a domestic setting, setting with our memory at the centre of the work. Especially now that physically tuning an analogue radio is almost a thing of the past. And so, to make the wallpaper, I made drawings of all the little components that actually make up a, make up a radio. I sort of did the research on what they were and what they did, and then drew them. And then I decided that people must tune their own radio, so I used a chest of drawers with a speaker in each drawer on a different wavelength for people to discover for themselves. I've made um, three short films this year and um, this is a kind of natural continuation from the final show that I did last year, um, visiting uh, landscapes and edge land. Um, this year it's about places that nobody else really cares about, um, peripheral places, um, which is why I gave it the title On the Periphery. Um, the first film I, sh I shot in Reading um, on the edge of the city where the river um, joins the um, very busy uh, business di district on one side and the um, parks and wasted spaces on the, on the far side. Um, and the second one's about um, 
more of a wasteland and woodland area and it's about being watched and watching um, and I've used words that um, I chose after taking this footage and I've asked other people from the group to speak them in different languages um, and this kind of makes you feel a little bit more peripheral um, because perhaps you don't understand that language and the film itself makes you feel slightly uncomfortable. And the third film is about ants and how um, they really are peripheral but perhaps we're peripheral to them. Um, I want to show these films in a space and that had always been my kind of idea. So I want you, as you go in, to feel a bit unnerved, a bit peripheral maybe, um, to find your way to the back of the space and then to watch these films and see what you make of it. Okay, so I've been building a monument. And I'm doing that because um, I've been thinking about the theme of things that are very monumental and uh, resist or refuse change and things that are very ephemeral and often remain invisible or unrepresented. And um, this came out of our trip to Rome and particularly the visit that we had to the sports stadium which was built by Mussolini and uh, any representations of the female form were entirely absent and um, when I asked a question about this I, I was told as often said about monuments um, that we can't change the past and so there's no point trying to transform them in any way and I thought about that and I thought that's not a satisfying answer for me because every time a monument is put up there's inevitably another story that's not put up that has to do with that monument and um, in this case in the sports stadium it was the story about women so I'm building this monument and then I've also been casting egg-like shapes inside balloons with plaster and on top of the monument, where there should be a very macho image of a warrior, a guy kind of character, um, there will be some, there will, he will be missing, and instead there will be some of these eggs. Um, so the eggs also connect to one of the first stories I heard when we visited a museum in Rome where Livia, who was the wife of the Emperor Augustus, um, was sitting in her out-of-town villa and apparently a hen of notable whiteness fell out of the sky and landed in her lap. And this was considered to be an auspicious sign. I came to this project um, by reading Emily Bronte's novel uh, Wuthering Heights. I actually reread it. And some of the characters within it, they are really rather striking in their extreme behaviours. That brought me to think about uh, psychology and aspects of personalities Emily might not even have known in her day of writing. Um, where does jealousy come from? What happens when people feel hurt? How do they behave? And what is that? what does that create within us? Um, so it didn't take me too long to come to the word of threshold because we get across emotional thresholds, practical thresholds, we walk through door frames, we kiss people, our bodies can be violated, we actually encounter them all our lives. Um, then the question came up how to transpose this into imagery. Um, and because I have a background that is quite linked to paper, um, I chose that material. And it was easy to show thresholds just by ripping paper, making holes smaller, bigger, layering these holes, uh, and marking the edges. That's really what the work is about. There's very little to see 
there were holes, there were edges, there were thresholds. Okay, so my, in my project I'm trying to explore what it means when we say I. And so the initial idea was to, so what is called, what the, the proper project that was called alter ego. Uh, the, so the idea is to take uh, photos with a pinhole camera with multiple exposures. And with the multiple exposures I captured different, let's say, personalities or lives that I live. And, um, and while I was starting taking those photographs, I realized how difficult it is to stay in a certain position without moving for a couple of minutes, because with a pinhole camera you have to take long exposures. And so, <clears throat> and then somehow I also um, realized that what I also really wanted to explore with this is trying to understand um, what Yes, what, what consciousness is and so on, um, is um, certain say episodes of hyper-self-awareness that I had when I was a child and a teenager. And in those episodes I would um, start thinking about uh, myself um, let's say from the outside. And those episodes were really scary because, um, because this uh, process of thinking um, of this self-awareness um, the process was uh, feeding back to itself. So I would start thinking about who is this person who thinks about uh, itself, who thinks about itself and so on. And uh, and that just kept amplifying. It was really terrifying. So usually I would just have to run to another room to distract myself. And so, and have always been curious about this, let's say this episode and so on. And so what I'm now trying also to do is to just stare at the pinhole camera for a certain amount of time. And, and yes, I'm not in that sense uh, multiple exposures, but really just trying to test myself and see what happens if I just have to sit there for five minutes, ten minutes and so on. So I got, uh, so I'm trying to increase the length of time gradually, until now I got to ten minutes. I'm planning to continue and see uh, what happens. Ultimately, I've, I've enjoyed all the projects on the course, but I still like using um, colour and, and painting, and I kind of wanted to somehow bring, bring that into my final project. Um, and I was, it, it was really following on from something I did earlier um, in the year um, on a, a course um, where we did some collaborative work, collaborative painting work. Um, so working in pairs on... Uh, just a, a small piece of paper and taking it in turns to to build up um, an image really using paints and crayons and um, uh, pencils um, and it, it's quite a you know it's sort of an hour and a half two hour maximum really spent on it and the, the, the thing is that you don't communicate during that time so you just it's kind of intuitive what the marks that you make and it's completely spontaneous um, and I guess you're communicating on a different level really and visually and seeing it via, via the marks that you've made um, and I really enjoyed that, I it was a really good process I, it was just great to, um, I like the fact that you don't know what the outcome is going to be you can't get too fastidious and you can't get sort of too sort of pernickety about what you're doing and also I thought it would be interesting to see what you could do I thought it was a good stepping stone to producing a bigger piece of work or to inspiring something else so I just wanted to take that further and explore it doing it with different people to see what sort of the outcome was with different people um, and um, I also wanted to take the idea of, of blowing it up onto a bigger scale further so um, that's basically I've done. So my work um, was really an experiment, um, and I was the experiment. Um, and they started off. It started off uh, from a series of small um, sketchbook paintings. Mm -hmm. um, which coincided with Lent. So for me, that's a, a part of my spiritual practice. 
Um, and so I was painting myself um, every day or every couple of days. Um, and, and they sort of turned out to be a kind of prayer, I suppose. That's part of my project. I, I've arranged that um, in layers. Um, so I think it kind of reflects the uh, person that my me as a person, uh, different layers, different aspects of my personality, different existential questions that I've got. So um, the smaller paintings were springboard into the larger piece, um, which was a challenge in itself. I've not done a painting that size before, particularly not of myself. Um, so when I started, I had no idea really what I was going to do. I thought about composition and things like that. And I had three figures in there to begin with. And gradually, one by one, I took them away. <laughs> um, and so it, it sort of emerged. It had a life of its own and emerged and taught me a lot of lessons along the way about um, decisions when you make when you make decisions about painting and how and um, what works on a larger scale that maybe doesn't on a smaller scale um, so so yeah the result is just one of me in the larger painting I wanted to celebrate this year um, because it's a hundred years of the right for women to vote and of course the suffragettes and the suffragists um, suffered enormously. So I'm coming back to suffering again. So I mean, they, they fought um, their pitch, they were thrown around, um, they organised, um, they were force-fed, as we all know, and brutally treated by police, etc., etc. And um, so I think it's right to celebrate them and what they did for us. And... Um, so I wanted to celebrate that, and I just um, and vote for your feet. That was my title that I started. Um, your feet is what I was going to do, and I tried all different sorts of medium. I've ended up using plaster, so the empty shells of people's of women's feet. A few men thrown in here or there because they played a part as well, you know. As well. And also because I really like it, I've been doing like the soles of women's feet, like you get in, um, in a shoe, okay? And, um, and so I've been asking women to tread in some clay and tread on a piece of fabric. I'm going to cut these pieces out and they will accompany the plaster pieces. So it's the, the soft and the hard side of life and, and women's achievements. Another part of, the, of what I'm doing is washing women's feet. And um, but women have been doing it since the beginning of time, washing feet and washing bodies, and fantastic. Let's say thank you. I want to just say thank you to all those women who really suffered um, for all of you and me <laughs> and you and everybody here who's passing through here. Um, and that's what my piece is about, basically.